Well, good morning. It is the 17th Sunday of January, or the 17th of January, the second Sunday after Epiphany. And this morning, uh, we are in a different stage of the COVID protocol. And so it is no longer safe to have readers and intercessors in the room while we're recording. And in fact, the camera person is not in the room. Um, we will do our best. We'll do our best to try to give you a service that feels good and right and intimate. But we are certainly working under difficult circumstances. My friends, Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, ever creating, ever loving, ever leading, you are stillness when we are frantic. You are truth when we are confused and perplexed. You give us freedom when we are paralyzed by fear. You send us light when we stumble in the darkness. You our love when we feel lonely and empty. For all that you are, all that you have been, and all that you will be for us, we praise you, Creator, Christ, Spirit. We turn to you in worship to listen for your voice and to seek your way for us. And now, because your son called us to be a transformed people. We confess our failures and those thoughts and actions which separate us from you and from our neighbors. As together we say, merciful God, you call us to fullness of life, but we have settled for much less. We have wandered from your ways and wasted your gifts. We ignore the pain of others and turn our faces from injustice. At times, we have hidden from the truth, especially when it calls us to do what we are afraid to do. We have given up in despair when problems around us seem overwhelming. Forgive us our small faith Give us courage to listen and respond when you call. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now the collect for the second Sunday after Epiphany. Persevering God, by your sure voice, you rouse us from our slumber and call us to discipleship and mission in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first of today's readings comes from the first book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, for visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here am I, and ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. 
So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you did call me. But Eli said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. And now together we say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 11. Christ Jesus, by nature divine, did not grasp for himself a rank as equal with God. He chose to empty himself, becoming a humble servant and living the life of a human. And a human in every way, he abased himself still more, accepting death on a cross. So God has exalted him on high and given to him the name, the greatest of all the names, so that at Jesus' name every knee should bend low in heaven, on earth, and in the depths, and every tongue proclaim, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe me because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our, our Old Testament lesson today from Samuel is a wonderful, wonderful lesson. As a child, I remember doing the story of Samuel and Eli on a felt board, right here in, in, in this place. And it was, was wonderful, it was lovely. However, the lovely felt board story does not take us into the depth and the power of, of what's going on here. So let's take a deeper look at it. We have to understand that at the time this, this story is about, that Israel was a marginal community. It was a community that it was on the rocks. 
externally, the threats were coming from the Philistines, a, a, a warring nation who had the ability and the desire to overpower Israel. Internally, there were all kinds of problems. The, the judges who ruled over them, they were corrupt. And the priestly caste, in particular the sons of Eli, they were sexual predators. And they were as corrupt as the judges. Israel was in chaos absolute chaos and there was no will and no ability to set things right. And, and into this mess comes a character named Hannah. And Hannah was a woman who was barren. She had no child. She had no prospects. And, and if, if we think of scripture, if we think of scripture, barrenness is always the precursors to something extraordinary. Sarah was barren and she gave birth to a nation. In the New Testament, Elizabeth is barren and, and she gave birth to John the Baptist who would pave the way for the coming of the Christ. In our, our story today, uh, Hannah, she was barren. She was barren at a time that Israel was going to hell in a handbasket. But she was a woman of profound faith. And she pleaded with God and prayed to God that if only, if only he would give her a child, that she would give that child back to him as a Nazarite to serve him forever and, and for all time. And so Hannah had a child. And as, as our story picks up today, this child, true to her word, was given to Eli the priest to serve him in the temple, to be nurtured by him, to be trained by him, so that he could serve God in God's temple. It is a story which is, uh, it is comedic, it, it is tender, it is powerful, and it is ironic. First, first the comedy. Um, the name Samuel means God heard. The name Eli means God. And so here we have in this story, this young child, Samuel, who is in his bed and the voice of Yahweh calls to him, Samuel, Samuel, God heard, calls, God heard. And, and, and Samuel says, here I am. But he thinks it's Eli, God calling. So while the God is calling him, he goes to his God and says, here I am. And Eli, God says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And, and this kind of slapstick comedy goes back and forth. Make no mistake about it, Jewish people, knew about comedy in their writing. And this is a lovely, lovely story. But the tender part comes when this Eli, this, this priest who is caring for and nurturing Samuel, this priest whose sight has dimmed, he's virtually blind. Uh, he's been in and out of being asleep. But finally, he is more awake in this story than he has been in years. He understands what is going on. And he says to Samuel, listen, next time you hear the voice, you say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And so he does. 
And that is the wonderful, the, the, the kind of breakthrough moment. Um, the part that is earth shaking, the part that is powerful actually comes right after this reading. Uh, when Eli says to Samuel, tell me what God said to you. And and Samuel held nothing back. He told Eli, this faithful priest, that because he had failed as a father, because his sons were corrupt, because his sons were sexual predators, that the priestly power and authority, all that had been promised to him forever, was going to be taken away forever. Eli's life and the life of his family, it was about to be changed in a punishment that there was no turning back. And what that meant, what that meant was that the future of Israel was being vested in, put in the hands of this young child. This young child who people would come to know as a powerful prophet, as a military leader. They would come to know him as a kingmaker as he appointed and anointed Saul and later David as king. He would be the one who set Israel on the course to greatness because of Samuel. Nothing would ever be the same again. The irony is that the appointment of Saul as king, the anointing of David as king, all of that would come after Samuel was identified as a failed father like Eli before him. It's an extraordinary story. An extraordinary story of God doing a new thing. Of God initiating a makeover, if you will, social, political, religious makeover for God's people a reboot of history and what made it possible, what made it possible was the faith of a barren woman, the openness of a young child to hear the word of God and the grace of an old priest to nurture that child even when it meant him losing his position Faith, openness, grace, and a peaceful transition of power. Imagine that. Okay, let's, let's move on to the gospel reading. Uh, now, John's gospel, which our reading is from today, uh, chapter one begins by inundating us with titles for Jesus. Uh, Jesus in the first chapter of John's gospel is called the Word, the Lamb of God, Rabbi, Messiah, the one of whom Moses and the prophets wrote, which is to say the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, Son of God, King of Israel. What, what John is doing in the first chapter of his gospel is basically saying to folks, listen, before we go on, let's make it perfectly clear just who and what we are talking about. We are talking about God doing a new thing. We are talking about God being present and active in Jesus. We are talking about one who is the Son of God, the Messiah, the true King of Israel. And, and as our reading picks up today, as our reading picks up today, Jesus is in the process 
of putting together his home team. Uh, the day before, uh, a couple of John's disciples had followed him and, and, and said, Jesus, where are you going? Where, where do you live? And he said to them, come and see. Now, he wasn't saying, come and see my house. Come and see what a great place I live in. When he said, come and see, what he was saying to them was, come and understand. Come and experience. Come and experience God. Now, with today's passage, um, he found Philip. And he simply said to Philip, follow me. And Philip saw something in Jesus that was worth following, and so he did. And, and, then, and then Philip, he, he goes off. He goes off to, uh, to Nathaniel, and he says to him, we found the one about whom Moses and, and the prophets would have been writing. We found the one who is the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, which is to say, we have found him. We have found the Messiah. And, and he's this Jesus from Nazareth. And, and, and Nathaniel makes the, question, the statement, which at first sounds a bit off. He said, could anything good come from Nazareth? Which would be kind of like somebody in London saying, could anything good come from St. Thomas or Aylmer? And it sounds a bit cheeky, but that's, I don't think is what he was saying. Uh, because the Messiah, according to the scriptures, was not supposed to come from Nazareth. So anyone who was a student of the scriptures would know that if someone said, we have found the Messiah, he comes from Nazareth, scripturally it would be, well, no, I don't think so. That's not where he's supposed to come from. But then, but then, Philip says to him the same words that Jesus spoke to those who followed him before. He said, come and see, come and experience, come and experience God. Trust me on this. And, and, so, and so he did. And Jesus said to Nathanael, listen, you're a true Israelite. You have no deceit in you. You are about justice and righteousness. I can see that. And, and then Nathaniel says, well, how do you know that? You, you've just met me. And Jesus said, and he's talking about a vision here. He said, I saw you under a fig tree before Philip ever called you. Now he wasn't even in the same town where, where Nathaniel was when Philip called him. So this is clearly a vision. And when he talks about the fig tree uh, in Micah and in Nehemiah, the fig tree is an image for, for someone sitting peacefully in the kingdom of God under their own fig tree. And, and so he's saying, listen, I had a vision of you in God's kingdom, sitting in peace and, and security. And at that point, Nathaniel, it's like, I want some of that. Surely, surely you must be the Messiah. Surely you are the King of Israel. And then Jesus has more for him. He said, you're gonna see far more than that. And he says, listen, listen to these words. You are gonna see greater things than these. Truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It's a very clear reference to the vision of Jacob at Bethel, uh, where, where the angels were ascending and descending on the stairway to heaven. And what Jesus is saying to him is, listen, heaven and earth are locked together in an embrace and you will see Yahweh, God, at work in me. You will see God present in me. You will see God's love in me. So come and follow me. Come and follow me. I, I think that those two readings kind of speak 
to us today in terms of our world. Um, remember the start of uh, start of our Old Testament lesson. We heard these words: "The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread." The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Uh, as our world becomes more secular, as our world becomes more pained and distracted because of things like COVID and political and military unrest, the word of the Lord does indeed seem to be becoming more rare. Visions not widespread. I think what this is saying is that this, this passage about Samuel, it's written about our world. It's where we're living. All the stuff that goes along with barrenness, about hopelessness and, and despair, uh, external threats and internal threats, political nonsense. It, it, that's the stuff of human life. It, it, it always has been. But the lamp of God, the light of God, it has not gone out yet. It has not gone out yet. And, and I would suggest to you that, that there are two phrases that we heard in the readings that for us are really critical right now. Uh, the first came from the lips, the lips of Samuel to God. When God said, Samuel, Samuel, and the child at Eli's behest said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I think right now, in the season of Epiphany, as we head into Lent, at the season of confusion and despair in our world, we need to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We need to commit ourselves to the study of Scripture and to prayer. And we need to listen, not so much with our ears, but in our heart and in our spirit. We need to listen for what is pure and what is right and what is true and what is life-giving. And we need to speak that word and we need to do that word. And it is critical. The lamp of God has not gone out, but the light's getting pretty dim. It's getting pretty dim. And we also, we need to listen to the words of Jesus as he said, you will see greater things than this. You will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So come and see. Come and experience. Come and understand. Right now, in our church communities, and it's tough, it's tough because of COVID, it really, really is, uh, because we can't do anything the way we normally could. We can't worship the way we normally could. Our our pastoral care is being done over Facebook and Zoom and telephone. Meetings are happening through Zoom. Nothing is the way it was, and yet, and yet, and yet. We need to be able to say to people, come and see, come and experience. Come and experience God's love, God's presence in our community. And that might sound like an odd thing to say, but I can tell you that, that in, in my life and in my ministry, in my experience, 
I believe I have, I believe I have seen God, experienced God in hospital rooms as people held the hands of their loved ones as they breathed their last breath. And, and God was there. I have experienced God in struggling marriages that found a way to survive, that were made whole again. I have experienced God in relationships that fell apart, but the individual somehow found the strength to pick themselves up and dust themselves off and get on with living. I have experienced God in the hearts and in the lives of people whose lives collapsed around them and yet found a way to live again and love again and laugh again. I have experienced God in the extraordinary care that our people have given to the elderly and the vulnerable. I have experienced God in the love that we have for one another. Oh, the church often gets it wrong, to be sure. We have twisted God's word time and time again so that it represents what we want. We have twisted God's word in a way that allows us to get our own way. There are times in which the church has been dysfunctional. But at our best, at our best, we are a place where God is present, where God's love is present, where the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God, the joy and the peace which God's bring, that's what defines the community. And now, right now, at this point in time when the church is struggling for survival, when our communities are struggling for survival, when our word is struggling for survival, as church, as the people of God, as baptized followers of Jesus, we need to be able to say, come and see. Come and experience, come and understand that you are loved, you are precious, you are a child of God. Come and feel the love. That's who we are, is what we're about. And, and the world needs us. The world needs us to be nothing less. The world needs us to be our best. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Come and see. Words for us to live by. Words for us to reboot the church, to reboot our society. Words for us to reboot our world by. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Come and see. Come and experience. Come and understand that God is present. Amen.
Now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Shema, Hear, O Israel. Together we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. God of all life and each life. Each week, our prayers combine with those of people in many different places, cultures, and languages. We face many different challenges and also a common challenge, responding to the pandemic, though in so many different contexts. We thank you for honoring all our prayers with the gift of your spirit so that we may find strength and wisdom we need in you. We remember before you today people living face to face with war and violence in those places where hatred has been stirred up and fear stalks people on their own streets. And we pray for all those displaced by violence, seeking refuge among us or in camps and communities around the world. God, speak to us a word of peace. Embrace us with your love. We remember before you today people living face to face with so much economic uncertainty. For those who have lost their jobs or worry what may happen as this year unfolds. God, speak to us a word of reassurance. Embrace us with your love. We remember before you today people living face to face with discrimination and social prejudice. For those who are bullied at school, at work, or at home. For those who are made ashamed of who they are. God, speak to us a word of dignity. Embrace us with your love. We remember before you today people living face to face with illness and suffering. For those struggling with disability made more complex these days. And for those who know grief or anxiety, especially those cut off from comfort or support by months of pandemic isolation. God, speak to us a word of healing. Embrace us with your love. We remember before you today people divided by differences of race or creed, of culture, gender, or generation. And we pray for all those who seek to build bridges of understanding and cooperation across those things which separate us. God, speak to us a word of reconciliation. Embrace us with your love. We remember before you today your whole creation and its many vulnerable facets and faces. Teach us how to care for the rips and tears in the fabric of the world you love, so we may live together wisely. God, speak to us a word of wisdom. Embrace us with your love. And so, joining our voices to Jesus' followers around the world, we pray the words he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, my friends, where God's love resides, there is wholeness. Where God's peace inhabits, there is harmony. Where God's spirit lives, there is freedom. So may the God of gentle whisper infuse your lives with all that is good, all that is pure, all that is holy, so that you may be a fragrant offering wherever you are needed. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.